everybody, and welcome back to Discovery Street Storytime. We are continuing our series on the covenants of the Bible and what we can learn about our relationship with Jesus by studying covenant. We've been doing a lot of learning in the Abrahamic covenant and the old covenant for the past two weeks. Today, we're going to be going back to the old covenant and talking about the law. Now, before we start, let's do the thing we always do. If you haven't yet, go grab your Bible and then come back. You can push pause and then you can just restart it where you are and pick back up. So the law, let me ask you a couple of questions. How many of you find it really easy to obey? Hmm. How many of you ever wonder why it's so hard to obey? That's a great question, isn't it? And how many of you have ever wondered, you know, why we can't do the things that we want to do when we want to do it the right way and why we always end up making bad decisions when we're trying to do things the right way? Oh, it gets really frustrating, doesn't it? Last week, we actually talked about why God even gave us the rules or the laws of the old covenant to begin with. But before we dive in, let me just back up a little bit and let's talk about what we learned about the old covenant last week, because this is really important and this is going to set up our story today. So if you remember, we talked about the fact that the old covenant is conditional. That means that it's got requirements that the people have to do. What was the big requirement? Well, the people had to obey. It was completely based on their obedience. And God promised them that if they did obey, he would bless them in so many different ways. But he also promised them that if they didn't obey, he would bring down curses and punishments on them. That made this covenant really all about the law. Because the obedience, that part of it, the people, they promised that they would obey the law. And if you remember, Moses actually took stone tablets up the mountain to God, where God, using his finger, inscribed all the laws on the stone tablets so that people could see them. The stone tablets actually acted as a sort of sign, a visible outward reminder of the covenant and the agreements the people had made to God to keep the covenant, to obey the law. The problem was, as we learned last week and as we've learned through many different Bible stories, it was impossible for the people to actually keep the law. That's why in Romans 7, Paul talks about this idea of why can't I do the good that I want to do? And why do I keep doing the bad that I don't want to do? But we're going to find some answers out today. So let's dive in. Now, it's important that we go to the Bible to understand what God wants us to understand about this covenant. But first, we have to talk about the Abrahamic covenant because it plays a massive part in what we're going to talk about today. Now, if you have your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and I want you to turn to the New Testament and to the book of Galatians. Now, when you get to the New Testament, remember, you're going to go past the first four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then you're going to keep going past the book of Acts, past the book of Romans, and past the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And that's going to bring you to Galatians. So, Turn all the way. You can see how far past I am in my Bible. Turn to Galatians chapter 3 and hold your spot. Here's what is so important. Okay, in the Abrahamic covenant, God promised Abraham land and seed. We typically call the land of Israel the promised land. And it's because God promised it to Abraham. But check this out. When the old covenant came along, God basically said the biggest punishment for you guys disobeying and breaking this covenant is I'm going to kick you out of the land. So do you see the connection to the land? The Abrahamic covenant, God promises the land and says, I will give your descendants this land. And the old covenant comes along and says, I'm going to kick you out of the land if you don't obey my law. Does that mean that the old covenant replaces the Abrahamic covenant? Let's find out by going to God's word. Okay, chapter three, verse 16. This is really important. This is what it says. 
I'm going to find it in just a second. Hang with me and I will get it. Ah, here we go. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. So who were the promises spoken to way back in Genesis chapter 15? They were spoken to Abraham, but they were also spoken to his seed, which is referring to Christ. Now, I'm going to throw up a picture on the screen right now. This is a timeline, and I want to walk you through what's happening, okay? So when we look at this, we go all the way back. We can see the Garden of Eden. This is Adam and Eve. And then we fast forward and we see Abraham. And then right way later after that, we see Moses, right? Now, do you remember who the seed that was promised to Abraham was? Well, it was Isaac initially, but it was also really referring to Jesus. Jesus was the descendant that was going to bless the entire world that God told Abraham about in Genesis chapter 12. Now, here is the important part. Throw this timeline slide back up. The Abrahamic covenant happened way back here. Okay. God didn't give Moses and the Israelites the covenant of law until 430 years later. Here. Does that mean the old covenant, the covenant of law takes the place no way. How do we know that? Check out Genesis 3, verse 17. This is what it says. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. Abraham's inheritance of the land and seed is based on God's promise. And the law cannot erase that. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, why did God even give them the law? All right, to find that answer, let's read Galatians 3.24, because this is going to tell us why God gave them the law. And it's actually your memory verse for the month of March. So check this out. Galatians 3 verse 24 says this, therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. Now, there are a couple of big words in there, so let me break them down. The word justified means to be declared righteous. So, the law is a tutor that leads us to Christ so we can be made right or declared righteous because of faith. Hang with me. There's another big word. What's a tutor, right? It says the law is a tutor that leads us to Christ so that we can be justified by faith. Well, this is another treasure word, and it's in the Greek. It's the word paidagogos, okay? It's a masculine noun, and among the Greeks and Romans, this name was applied to trustworthy slaves who were given the responsibility of watching over young boys that belonged to wealthy parents. So they were kind of like babysitters, okay? Wherever these kids went, they took their paidagogos with them, their tutor, that tutor guarded them. If they left the house, that tutor was with them and they walked them to school and then back or to the park and then back or to the store and then back. Wherever these boys went, these paidagogos, these tutors acted as a guardian to watch over them and to lead them somewhere. Well, how does that help us? Well, do you see the word picture here? If the law acts as a tutor or guardian and it leads us somewhere, where does it lead us? That's a great question. And it's actually, the answer is found in your memory verse. Galatians 3.24 says, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. Lead us where? To Christ. Well, how does it do that? Another great question. It's actually kind of easy if you think about it. You know what? Why does a kid who was just told, don't run into the road, automatically want to run into the road. In fact, as soon as the parent told the kid not to run into the road, it's the only thing the kid wanted to do. I know you guys have experienced this. I, in my own kids, my own kids have shown me this. I remember many times we'd be sitting at the Salsaritas in Turkey Creek outside of the tables. And one of my kids would look at me and I would say, don't you go in that road, it's dangerous. 
And you know what they would do? They would walk right up to the curb and they would stand on the edge of the curb. They desperately wanted to go into the one place they weren't allowed to go. Did you guys know that this is actually a biblical principle? This actually makes sense, okay? Did you know that Romans chapter seven tells us that the law stirs up in us the desire to do bad things? I'm gonna read Romans 7, 5, but I've put it in my own words to help you understand. Check this out. Sinful desires were at work within us and the law made us wanna sin even more. So we did, and it resulted in our death. Did you hear that? The law makes us want to sin. The second we are told not to do something, we want to do that very thing. I know you guys have experienced this. How many of you hate to be told when to go to bed? Mm -hmm. Every kid hates bedtime. They always wanna stay up later. Listen to what Romans 7, 18 and 19 says. This is Paul talking, by the way. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do, this I keep on doing. Have you guys ever felt this way? You try and try to do good, but instead you somehow end up messing up and doing the very thing you're trying not to do. Guys, this is the problem with our sinful nature. The law is good, right? Uh, going to bed, that's a good rule to have. We need sleep. We need to catch up. But it's our sin nature that's the problem. We don't like being told what to do. And we don't like having restrictions. So our sinful flesh wants to rebel against it and do things our own way. So even when we try to do good things, we're wrestling against our own nature. As we close today, I want to tell you three things about the law. First of all, I want to talk about the purpose of the law. You see, the purpose of the law, we learned this last week, was for their instruction. The whole purpose of the law is to explain what sin is. This is right. This is wrong. Do this. Don't do this. It's a boundary. It shows you how to do what's right and will please God. And it warns you about things that if you do it will be wrong and will not please God. So the purpose of the law is just to explain what sin is. We need to know what sin is. Now, the result of the law, frustration, because we can't keep it. The law just keeps showing us how bad we really are. And it's frustrating and we don't like it and we keep messing up. And it's, it's not a good feeling. Galatians 3.10, by the way, also tells us that in order to be made right by the law, we have to keep all of the law. We can't mess up even one time or, we'll, or we are guilty of breaking the whole law. Can you even imagine that? Guilty of breaking the whole law with just one. And I don't know about you, but I've messed up too many times to count anymore. But there is good news. There's a benefit to the law. There's a good side. The purpose, it explains what sin is. The result, super frustrating, right? We keep messing up. The benefit, it starts making us want something better. It makes us want a better way. So the benefit of the law is what we talked about and it's in your memory verse, Galatians 3, 24. It's our tutor. It's our guardian, right? That leads us to Christ because he's the answer, he's the better way. When we surrender our lives to Christ, he gives us the ability to actually succeed. After failing over and over again, we start asking, isn't there a better way? And there is, it's Jesus. Jesus's way, Jesus's covenant, the new covenant, it's way better than the old covenant. And we're gonna be talking about that in the weeks to come. Let me pray and then I'll close out and you guys can go on your way, have a great day. God, we thank you so much that you've given us the law so that we understand what sin is. Even though it's frustrating, even though we struggle to keep it and to obey, we know that you are faithful, you are merciful, and that you love us. And, and you tell us in your word that if we are faithful to confess our sins, you are faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
God, help us to really understand the difference between the old covenant and why you gave us the law to begin with and what we're about to learn in the next couple of weeks. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, have a great week. I'll see you back here next Sunday.